Welcome to our live webcast, Growing Pains in Limb Alignment, What's Okay and What's Not. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lillian and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. There is also closed captioning provided with this program and it is located directly under the presentation. On the right hand side of your screen, you will see the text chat window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you will type in your questions. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the send button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. At the conclusion of today's program, we ask that you complete a brief CME evaluation summary form. Please take a moment to complete this survey in order to receive credit for attending the webinar. We are joined today by our speaker, Dr. Barbara Minkowitz. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our speaker. Go ahead, doctor. Hello, um, thanks for joining me today, and we'll get started immediately. Uh, first, I'd like to say I have no disclosures to make. By the end of today's lecture, you should know how to evaluate limb alignment in children, know the normal variants that change with age, and when to consider an orthopedic consult for surgical intervention of abnormal limb alignment, and how to think about growing pains in children from the orthopedic perspective. Limb alignment needs to be thought about in three dimensions. You have the AP, or the frontal plane, where you can see varus or valgus of the legs. And basically, varus is going to be when you're bow-legged, and valgus will be when you are knock-kneed. Limb alignment, uh, limb length difference, difference would be when you have one leg longer than the other, as you can see in this picture here. You also want to look at the lateral plane, which is the side view. In the side view, you can see if the patient has recurvatum or if they hyperextend their knee, or if they have procurvatum, where they have the opposite deformity. You can't see rotational deformities on x-ray since x-rays are two-dimensional, but you do need to take into account when you're looking at the child, if they have these rotational deformities. They can have femoral antiversion or retroversion, which is when there's a twist in the femur itself that allows the legs to turn in more than they turn out if they have antiversion, or the opposite with retroversion. You can also have internal and external tibia deformities where the tibia can be turned in or have a twist inward, which causes in towing, or outward, where they cause them to out toe. So you need to consider the patient's age when you're really looking at their deformities to decide how serious you think they are or if they're going to need intervention. There are normal variants at different ages that we expect to correct over time. So since we expect resolution of most deformities in the young, we are not going to get that worked up about them. And things you see in the young are going to be the same things you see in the older kids. They'll be bow-legged, knock-kneed. They can be in-toed, pigeon-toed, um, double-jointed, or um, toe-walking. Toe-walkers, I just want to put a little note in here that although some kids do some toe-walking when they start walking, and some kids only toe-walk when they're out of shoes, if they're toe-walking all the time and it doesn't go away, don't wait too long to get the orthopedist involved. It can be a very hard habit to break. Um, abnormal findings are deformities that don't correct over time. They can be deformities that are progressive. They can worsen, especially during adolescence. And here's a nice picture of normal alignment, varus, and valgus alignment. Sur surgical correction of deformity may be needed. First, you have to know what's considered abnormal. There are more treatment options before skeletal maturity. So don't wait until the child is full grown to say, hey, why don't you get this checked out? We have something called guided growth, which is a procedure where you can influence the growth plate. You can make it grow the way you want it to grow. And this is kind of like a bonsai tree, where you make the bonsai tree grow 
the way you want it to grow? Well, we can make children straighten out as they grow, but we need time remaining for growth. Some options that we have are not dependent on skeletal maturity, such as cutting the bone like an osteotomy. Um, the cutting the bone is a much more involved procedure and therefore would require a lot more healing time and there can be a lot more complications. So we will do this if we have to, but we try not to get to that point. Deformities in the younger child, such as intoing, can be caused by um, various deformities in the lower extremity. They can be found at the foot itself, where you have metatarsus adductus, or what we call a banana-shaped foot. And right over here, you see how this foot is shaped like a banana versus this foot, which is not? Uh, this is very genetic, runs in families, and for the most part, tends to resolve over time. But sometimes it does need to be casted or even treated surgically, but very minor amounts of times. So if you have somebody that's not getting better, send them our way. Tibia torsion or pigeon toed children. Again, these should correct over time. By the time the child is eight, they should be gone or so little left that it doesn't matter. If by the time they're eight, they're still tripping, they're still having problems, then it's something we should talk about fixing. The same thing with um, femoral antiversion, although to a much lesser degree. Femoral antiversion is when the child can sit like a W because they've got so much turning in at their hips. And I tend to be very conservative, and I really don't operate on too many children for this because part of what we're doing is to straighten them out um, is cosmetic. And operating on these children's hips cause very long scars, you lose blood, I need a very good reason to be doing it. Usually, if you have a child that's still pigeon-toed by the time they're eight, then they have a combination of tibia torsion and femoral antiversion, and I will go for the, femoral antiver uh, the tibia torsion, not the femoral antiversion. So the ones that we're not going to um, fix because they get better over time are going to be the majority of the patients that you're going to see. Bow legs and knock knees. So this is genu varum and genu valgum. And an easy way to remember this is that genu varum has an R in the middle. It's closed, kind of like a bowed leg. So you see, this would be closed if the ankles were together. As opposed to valgus, where you have an open L. So that's knock knees. So it's kind of sort of like an L. So you know, just something to try to help you remember um, the difference or which is which. Our differential diagnosis is going to include physiologic deformities, which we treat by observation. As we just mentioned, the majority will disappear over time. Blount's disease is a type of bowing that gets worse over time. It needs surgery. It can be found in young children as well as adolescents. So you have bowing that's getting worse in a young child? Yeah, send them around. We need to take a look. Metabolic uh, problems can also cause bowing or knock knee, such as rickets. And treatment for that is going to be supplementation. Although sometimes when you have problems in adolescents due to rickets, they may still need surgery, especially if it's some of those genetic uh, inherited forms. Tumors and trauma can cause deformities such as bowing and knock knee. And again, these may need to be addressed surgically. In the younger child, which leg deformities are normal? Well, let's look at what happens in the younger child. So, when a child is born, they are the most knock kneed they're gonna be. And here's a picture, I mean, bow-legged that they're ever gonna be. Here's a picture of a bow-legged infant. So they're the most bow-legged at birth, over time, by the time they're about 18 months or a little bit before, that bowing should disappear. They can then enter a knock knee phase, or if they're not bow legged to be begin with, that's when their knock knee phase may begin. And that may continue and eventually um, be the worst at about three and a half years of age. 
By the time they're seven or eight, the NACME should be resolved, or at least most of it should be resolved, or there should be so little left that it doesn't matter. So you're going to look for problems when the child's deformity do not follow the natural progression or when they're getting worse. If a, if a mother brings a baby in to me, you know, 15 months, 20 months, and I say, do you think your child is getting worse over time? If they say the child is either the same or better, then I know we're fine. If they say the child is worse, that's a different story. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that kind of answer from the parent to help you decide what to do. Let's talk about patient one. Patient one is a two-year-old boy who's obese. He's got bowed legs. The bowing was present at birth, but has gotten progressively worse. The neighbors tell mom that he looks like a monkey. On physical exam, he's severely intoed with bowed legs. And there is a family history of somebody needing surgery on their legs in the past. Do we worry about him? So I'll wait a minute to see if any of you want to give me a quick answer. Do you think that this child is going to have a problem that we need to intervene for? And um, we got some very good answers so far. So yes, let's go on to uh, see what the answer is. And the answer is indeed yes. We do need to worry because the deformity is progressive, because there's a family history of somebody needing surgery. And indeed, this patient has had progression of their deformity after 18 months of age. 18 months is a key time point in the baby's life. If the child is having increasing deformity, that's when we start taking x-rays. We don't really x-ray them at 12 months or 14 months, 18 months. In this case, the child had an x-ray, and this x-ray shows that the child has tibia vara, otherwise known as Blount's disease. You can see there's beaking of the um, tibia on both sides, and this, um, so this is genetic, and this could very well have been what the other family member had that needed surgery. This needs orthopedic care which can include surgery as early as before the age of three. Basically, you want to get this straightened out as fast as you can to try to get it to grow normally. But um, I've had patients I've taken care of with this, and you can end up operating on these kids a couple of times before you finally get them to a point where they're straight and they stay straight. It's just not easy with these children. So red flags for abnormal bowing curve progression with time, as we saw in this child, sharp asymmetry, sharp curves are, sorry, sharp curves, like you see on this child here. Um, you see how sharp this angular curve is. That's not a normal gentle bow that you would see in anybody. And asymmetry, and in this case, this child is asymmetric. Anytime you have an asymmetry between the limbs, you need to be considering that you've got something bad going on. So let's talk about growing pains. Growing pains are usually between the age of 4 to 14 during the growth period. Now, different people look at them differently. I'm the orthopedist. I'm looking, at, looking for a tangible orthopedic reason for their complaints. And very often, I'll find something that we can work on that will be helpful. The rheumatologist is going to look for some rheumatic reason for it. The physiatrist may look, you know, for some other uh, reasons for why the patient has pain. Um, and at the end of the day, the patient may just have pain, and it's growing pains. And whatever we're attributing to the reason for it may have nothing to do with it. But as the orthopedist, I try to optimize my patients. So, when do we worry about somebody that comes in with complaints of growth while growing? So is the pain unilateral? Like I said already, unilateral pain is just not acceptable. If you have symmetric limb pain, this is something that is normal to see when you're growing. Both legs hurt, your growth spurting, we're good. You treat the patient by reassurance with expectation of resolution. If it doesn't resolve, even if it's symmetric, 
you know, send them around. Maybe there's something we can optimize to make them feel better, especially in the older patient, but the younger patients too. If you have continued progressive unilateral pain, that's bad. So we need to see that. But the reality is that growing pains may start on one side. So what you're seeing may be fine. But if it's only one side, you don't want to be watching it too long without having somebody take a, take a peek at the patient. So what are we looking for as an orthopedist? Well, some conditions masquerade as growing pain. Um, and like I said, the rheumatologist is looking for some sort of arthritis that's giving you growing pains, and they can medicate those patients. The orthopedist, we're looking for something that's going to give you growing pains that we can intervene with, such as tight tendons. These kids are growing. Lots of them have the genetics where they're growing tight. So you end up with tight hamstrings, tight heel cords, tight IT bands, glutes, quads, hip flexors. And these kids are trying to walk at the very least, play sports at the very most, and they're pulling on these tight tendons. And it hurts. And it's like walking in molasses because their legs are not doing what they want them to do because they're too tight. Hence the reason why everybody's involved in yoga nowadays. It would be nice to get the kids involved young, but some of them are probably not going to do that, maybe not at all or at least until they're older. The other thing that gives you pain is limb alignment. If you're very knock-kneed, if you're very bow-legged, it's going to slow you down. Your mechanics are off. You're going to be fatigued. You're going to have pains. You're not going to do a lot. And that's another thing that is related to growth because you're growing like that. And so you could call it growing pains. So let's talk about a couple of four-year-olds. I try to make everybody the same age just so you could see how these patients all come to me and they can look the same in the office, but you have to listen to the story. You have to listen to what the mom is saying. In this case, we'll start with patient two. This is a four-year-old with a left limp, pain for two months. The limp and the pain started after soccer. The pain gets better with rest, but returns with activity. He limps off the soccer field every time. So mom comes in, and she just doesn't like that he's limping every time he plays soccer. But he's not complaining. Patient three, we have a four-year-old boy who complains of pain at bedtime. He points at his knee or behind the knee. Mom's not sure, but she thinks the pain is always on the same side. But maybe it's both sides, but she doesn't know. The pain occurs after being active all day. So if he's quiet all day, not much going on. He feels better with massage from mom. So in my office, like I said, they all look the same. It's kind of like a black box, Pandora's black box. You don't know what's going to be inside because they all look the same. So here we have these patients have no pain in the office, no limp, whole range of motion, hips, knees, ankles. They're non-tender to palpation. They have a normal exam, except they both have tight hamstrings. So if the pain is unilateral, you have to get an x-ray, which in a four-year-old, they tend to all be normal, but you got to do it. All right, so we do our x-ray. It's normal. We're left with tight hamstrings. Most four-year-olds are not tight, but a significant number of them are. So if you're already getting a kid who's tight, then you need to start thinking about what are the hamstrings doing. So really, so this comes down to most patients that come to my office have no pain. Their problem is still real. I can't say, okay, I don't see anything. You're good. Good to go. Bye. This doesn't help the parent, you know, and they, they'll continue to have issues. It's nice to at least try to help them. So some pains are activity-related, as here. Asymmetry, like I said before, you know, they come in, complain on one side, maybe both in the future. So patient two who's limping off the field is probably pulling their hamstrings when they're running off the field. So they probably have, you know, a little bit of a hamstring sprain or strain. Um, if they have pain by the adductor tuberosity, then, you know, maybe they're pulling their adductor. In any case, something to work on is to make sure they're stretched out before they go play. You know, hence stretching before you play. Patient three has pain 
probably due to hamstring spasming at night. The hamstrings are tight due to growth. The bones grow faster than the soft tissue. People are genetically tight in some families. Um, so, um, so, you know, you need to stretch those out. Now, some patients have pain without hamstring tightness. There's nothing you can see. They have pain at night, um, wakes them up from sleep even, and um, those patients, I, there's not much I can do for them. You know, that's classic growing pains, may, you know, go on for a long time. And I will have, you know, rheumatology uh, take a look at them just to see if there's something else they can do for them. With all of these patients, I advocate for bone health because things that can give you spasming are being, you know, short on calcium or potassium, you know, and then comes the vitamin D. So, you know, I think it's important that you have a conversation with them and make sure that these are children that don't have milk allergies, that are not avoiding calcium foods, um, and that are getting some potassium uh, and vitamin D. And I, a lot of times I'll just ask them to add some. But that conversation is very important, and I have that with every single patient that walks in. And it's interesting to see how some of these kids have a zero intake of calcium, absolutely zero. All right, so now let's go to patient four. We'll keep talking about four-year-old boys for a while. So here's another four-year-old boy who complains of fatigue and pain walking. So he doesn't want to walk, he's always tired. He points at his legs his knees, his ankles, his feet, the, the whole leg. Both legs are involved. He trips when he's running, especially when he's tired. So that's telling me that he's got some coordination and it's gone when he's tired or sick. And a lot of times patients are brought to me after they've been sick because they just look so terrible when they're sick because they can't coordinate. Anyway, this patient gets better with rest. And his exam is similar to our other patients. He has no pain or limp in the office. He's got full range of motion. He's non-tender. But he's got bilateral genovalgum. He's not need. And with that comes flat feet. So one thing that you should know is that when you're not need, you tend to have flat feet. It's just the way, you know, your, your legs sort of come out at an angle. They hit the ground. And your foot kind of takes on this flat foot position. So you'll notice that the flat that with knock knees or flat feet and if you're not sure somebody has knock knees if you, they stand up and have flat feet and you lay them down and you put their kneecaps straight up so you're looking at them you know in the proper alignment you may start finding more knock knees anyway um, we didn't do an x-ray on him since his pain is symmetric and there's nothing to see in the office other than that he's knock kneed so the interesting thing here is that he's got about seven centimeters intermalleolar distance. So that's from one malleoli to the other. He's definitely got knock knees. You see how his knees are touching. And um, because of that, this can cause uh, pain and fatigue in, in children when they're walking. It's expected to resolve by the age of eight, as I keep saying. Now, this is an interesting picture. I get patients sent to me sometimes for limb length discrepancy. What I've noticed is that a lot of them are knock kneed. When you ask a knock kneed child to stand with their feet together, they overlap their knees and it makes one leg look longer than the other. So something to think about when you examine patients and they look knock kneed. This last patient I mean, this last picture of the same patient shows that he has his knees externally rotated. And by externally rotating both of his legs, he no longer has to walk with his knees knocked. He's going to walk out toed, and you're going to hide the knock knee. Now, this is very important when you see some of my other patients tonight that have been very clever at hiding their knock knees. So let's go on to the next one. So basically, any amount of knock knee in these little people, we're going to accept. You know, some of them look really, really bad. They've got so much knock knee, they all tend to go away. There's really not much left from this infantile or, you know, early childhood deformity. 
All right, now there are certain growing pains that are common in adolescent athletes. So let's look at these typical patients. We have, we're going to talk about 10-year-old boys. So we have a 10-year-old boy with pain at the knee when running in track. And so every time he'd run in track, he gets this knee pain. Now, since he hasn't stopped and rested, the pain is there all the time. So he wants to be seen. He wants to know what to do. The next 10-year-old boy is another one who does a lot of running in his sports. He's been wearing cleats. Now, as soon as you tell me you're wearing cleats, it, there's a, a, an automatic association for me. Um, and he's got pain at the heel. So he was playing soccer. Every time he'd stop playing soccer, the pain would go away. Now, however, the pain is there all the time. So we need to figure out how to help this child. So the first patient, when you examine them, has pain at the tibia tuberosity. And that is um, where the patella tendon inserts on the tibia. So we call this Osgood-Schlatter disease, because he's growing, he's got open growth plates and pain at the tibia tuberosity. This is seen in, in athletes, you know, do a lot of running or jumping like basketball. And it can flare up on and off while they're playing. There's a big, big very large, association with tight hamstrings and tight IT bands at the knee. And what that does is increases the force across the knee tremendously so that these children get these kind of pains more frequently than the ones that aren't that tight. The treatment for these kids are going to be rest, ice, 20 minutes at a time until the area is pink and numb so that they have no pain, they can't feel anything. I always tell them pre-frostbite, don't frostbite yourself, but don't give up before it's pink in them. And that brings the inflammation right down. Um, I like them to use a knee strap because this will hold the uh, patella tendon down so that um, they're not pulling on the tibia tuberosity as much. And then I'm a very big Arnica gel, and now Voltaren gel. Voltaren was just released over the counter in the United States. And these are two topical anti-inflammatories that work very well, much better than Icy Hot and some of the other ones. So I just, and they're, they're not expensive. So I always send the patients out for Arnica, Arnicare, Traumia, whatever brand they want, or Voltaren. And I send them to therapy, and we stretch out those hamstrings and those IT bands and heel cord or whatever else needs to be stretched. The key, though, is they need to learn a stretching routine that they can use at home. Now, when we talked about the four-year-olds earlier, what I tell those parents, aside from learning how to stretch, is enroll them in a little karate class or a little gymnastics class, something that's social where they can learn how to stretch and keep doing it. And the same thing here. These children need to learn how to stretch. Yes, they're going to go and the therapist is going to help them, but I'm not signing them up for a lifetime of therapy. And every time they grow, they're going to tighten up again. So what I've done since I got tired of them not stretching and then not having resources is um, a handout for today is called the Home Lower Extremity Stretching Program. It's a YouTube video that I made with my students that very neatly puts together home stretching exercises that every child needs, every coach needs. Uh, but instead of trying to figure them out by looking on different websites, we just put them together. And I make the parents or the kids take a picture of the QR code in the office so they can go home and have a resource and not tell me that, no, they, you know, they finished therapy and they're not doing therapy and they don't know what to do. So that's something new that we put up a couple months ago. It's a very big help. Now, bone health comes up again, and that's so critical because you're pulling on the bone. The bone's complaining. You have an inflammation in the apophysis, which is an area of the bone that you do a little bit of growing from. And if you made the bone stronger, 
then perhaps it wouldn't complain or it would stop complaining earlier. And I truly believe this. And so, again, we have that conversation about vitamin D and, you know, everything else they should be taking. So patient six has heel pain at the calcaneus. And this is also a growing area. This is the calcaneal apophysis. Um, they call this Seavers disease. And this is seen in athletes, especially those that run in cleats. Although I have patients that get it in sneakers, but to a much lesser degree. Um, it's very associated with a tight Achilles. So you gotta get that thing stretched out. Very, very important. And if their hamstrings are tight, you work on those as well. So again, you know, I'll refer you to the home uh, lower extremity stretching video. And these may flare up on and off depending on what activities they do. And I put down here, it's like a headache. You need to know what the protocol is for treatment. You don't need to call the doctor every time it happens. You need to be prepared. With the, um, you know, with the Osgood Schlatter, you wear your knee strap. You got your eyes, you've got your arnica, you got your stretching. Over here, same thing. If you're walking around in pain, well, then you need to stop walking around in pain. You need to wear a cam boot, calm that area right down with a, a heel cushion to absorb shock in the cam boot. You can put a heel cushion in your cleats. Um, you need to ice that area, like I said, 20 minutes at a time. Arnica or a trail meal or, um, trail meal or a Voltaren. Trail meal is a type of Arnica gel. So Arnica gel or Voltaren gel which is one of the non-steroidals, and stretch that heel cord. And again, bone health. Make the bone strong so that when you pull on it, it's not going to complain. So let's just diver, uh, digress a little bit and talk about basic bone health requirements. And I had a very clever student last year working with me, and we set up an index card or a business card, basically, that I give patients that has this written on it so that they cannot go home and then wonder what I said or lose my, you know, my office wrap up where all this information is always found. And basically, they all need vitamin D3. Um, they can get it as a liquid, you know, a drop or a gummy candy or a pill or t um, they can get it mixed with calcium if these are people that are not going to drink milk or orange juice with calcium or almond milk. Um, and they can get, um, uh, they can also, um, you know, drink the uh, orange juice and get their vitamin C that way or get adult gummy candies that have vitamin C are very tasty. Uh, and the patient will also need a multivitamin so that they can sort of hit these other uh, necessities such as silicon, boron, vitamin K, magnesium, and not all multivitamins are created equally. So we have, you know, spent some time with our students looking over which ones are better. And, I, you know, I just, I tell people to read the bottles. You know, look, look at what's in them. Um, one thing I want to point out is that if I give vitamin, when I give vitamin D3 to patients, because it's not if, I will, it's based on the size of the patient. So just briefly, up to 50 pounds, if the patient really doesn't have much of a problem, a multivitamin with 600 in it is good. A baby under one that's on formula is probably not even gonna get their 400 RDA units from the formula. They should be given a drop of vitamin D3, which could be 400 or 600. There are studies that show in infants that were given 1,200 units a day, um, and then, you know, check to see if they uh, got the flu, that either they did not get the flu or they had a very low viral load. So especially with COVID around, I think it's imperative to make sure the babies are getting at least 400, and I always say 600, you know, or, or if they're really worried, they can give them 1,000. It's fine. They're not going to OD them. Um, and then as the children get bigger, I'll add 1,000, you know, if they're between... 50 and 90 pounds and 2,000 if they're over 90 pounds. And when I have 200 pound patients, which I do, I have some kids that are either very heavy or they're just tall. And those patients need anywhere from five to 10,000 a day for their body mass. So, um, you know, and I will offer to and be happy to check their serum levels for them to see what the amounts of vitamin D for, do for them. So rather than just go by RDA, it has to be based on size. Um, now, 
calcium, three calcium drinks a day is very helpful. And could be two milk, one orange juice. You know, if they're going to start drinking almond milk, maybe they don't need to drink as much. But it's important for them to, uh, you know, to be thinking about this as a daily requirement. So what is unacceptable angular deformity in adolescents? So angular def limb deformity causes poor lower extremity mechanics and results in pain, instability, early arthritis. So in the adolescent, if we have progressive bowing, so now they're, we're getting up to 15 centimeters between the knees when the ankles are touching, then that's a problem, and they need to be x-rayed for Blount's disease. If, uh, if we're looking at knock knee deformity, which in my practice is more common, uh, and again, these things are genetic, so it depends what areas you live in, but I'm seeing a lot of knock knee children. And if you measure up to nine centimeters between their ankles when their knees are touching, then we consider that normal. We can easily accept up to 10 or 11. Once you get over 11 centimeters, it's really not considered normal mechanics, and it's going to give you issues. So now let's go back to our 10-year-olds. Let's talk about a 10-year-old girl with complaints of fatigue and knee pain while walking. She points at her knees. Both are involved. There's no pain now. She gets better with rest, but she doesn't want to participate in sports. So that's our 10-year-old. She's got full range of motion of hips, knees, ankles, and no pain in the office. So my classic patient. You know, imaginary pain, except it's not imaginary pain. She's got genu valgum. She has 10 centimeters between her ankles that nobody's noticed before because nobody turned her knees straight up and measured them. She's got tight hamstrings, Achilles, and IT bands. Now, let's talk about another 10-year-old. This is another girl who comes in with complaints of her kneecap dislocating. So mom wants her kneecap fixed because that's her problem. She points at her left knee, but she has no pain now. Her kneecap is where it should be at the moment. She gets better with rest. She can participate in sports because she can feel her kneecap trying to come out. So her kneecap is trying to dislocate. See that? It's trying to come out. But why is that? Well, let's look at this. So physical exam of this patient eight shows she's, again, full range of motion, hips, knees, ankles, non-tender to palpation, but severe genu valgum never noticed before. I get a kick out of this. How do you not notice that you are so knock kneed It's like a shocker when I point it out to them. But indeed, it is there. She had maltracking and subluxating of her patella. Again, very tight hamstrings, Achilles, and IT bands. And if your patient and family are not committed to stretching it out, it doesn't matter what you do. Even if you, you know, force these children to grow straight, they're going to be tight, and that's going to be an issue for them. So in this case, she's got 25 centimeters. So what's happening is that her quadriceps pull on the kneecap is all screwed up. So if we talk about the Q angle or the quadriceps angle, this describes the pull of the quadriceps on the kneecap. You, get, you draw a line from the anterior superior iliac spine to the middle of the patella, and another one from the middle of patella to the tibia tuberosity and just extend it, extend the line proximally. So that angle should be 14 to 17 degrees. Once you start increasing the intermalleolar distance and have lots of genu valgum, what happens is that your quadriceps is now pulling your kneecap laterally, and it's going to dislocate it. So the mechanics of the knee are all off. They're screwed up. And I always feel bad for kids that are skeletally mature because I really enjoy making them straight when they're growing, and I don't have not one kid who's ever regretted having surgery for that. Um, and he, there is some pain associated with it, but they get, like I always explain to them, you're very knock kneed now. You get to keep straight legs the rest of your life. And, you know, they, they like that. 
So patient seven only had seven centimeters between her ankles. I'm not getting that worked up about that, honestly. She needs therapy for her tight tendons. If you stretch her IT bands out, those actually make you look a little more knock kneed than you are anyway. So she may actually measure only nine centimeters when she comes back. Um, we'll have to see, but we're gonna focus on stretching with her and strengthening and core strength and all that stuff so we get her you know, able to run and participate in sports. Patient eight, she's in a bad way, but I am not fixing her kneecap, absolutely not. She needs surgical deformity correction because for me to do a big operation to correct her kneecaps when all I need to do is make her grow straight and then her kneecap will center itself, doesn't make any sense. So, and she needs a lot of therapy because she's so tight and we have to get the pull of all these tight muscles off her kneecap and get her to grow straight. So she needs guided growth, absolutely, hands down, nothing to discuss. Here's a picture of this girl that never noticed there was 25 centimeters between her ankles. And the reason, look at the way she stands when she externally rotates her knees and walks with her feet turned down. You would never notice that this girl is actually a little bit pigeon-toed and extremely knock-kneed. She's able to turn her hips out so much that she can compensate for everything and hide everything. So she needed guided growth. And this is also known as a hemiepiphysiodesis. So we're basic, basically going to tether the part of her knee that is overgrown compared to the opposite part, which is the inside. So the medial knee is too long compared to the lateral. It's like she's got hypoplasia of the lateral femoral condyle, which is a genetic thing. So this is what she has. So we put this plate with two screws in to um, both of her femurs on the inside, and we put a screw through her ankle on both sides, and lo and behold, we can make her grow beautifully straight. And now her kneecaps, whether they're perfect or not, they're staying centered. And if she does need her kneecaps fixed at this point, well, the mechanical axis of her leg is appropriate. So whatever surgery you do for her kneecaps, if you got to that point, is going to work now. Otherwise, it's going to fail because your mechanics are so bad. But she's not complaining. Her kneecaps are staying put. So to talk about adolescent genuvalgum, a.k.a. knock knee, you have poor knee and ankle mechanics. Your knee and ankle pain is unresponsive to therapy. You can have patella subluxation, dislocation, recurrent ankle sprains. I've, I've had kids that came in that needed surgery like this, guided growth, to straighten them out because their ankles kept coming out. And once you got them down, got the, the, uh, the amount of valgus down so that their ankles were closer, you know, the intermalleolar distance, they didn't sprain anymore. Um, you can get um, patients that have these painful soft spots on the knee joint, also known as an osteochondral um, defect or lesion, or chondromalacia of the patella or the femur, where you just sort of are abrading the joint surface. And I, I had one girl who kept getting them on her lateral condyle because when you're angled like this, all the pressure goes through this compartment. And so this kid was playing lots of sports. She kept getting these things. She went from one sports doc to the next, had them fixed, got them healed, then recreated them. And then I finally said, she came to me, and I sort of looked at her, and I said, well, you know, you're going to all the sports people. I'm a peace person. I want to straighten your leg out, and we can fix that while we're at it. And she did great. Strained her leg out and then got her healed, and they didn't come back again because we changed the, you know, I changed the alignment and the mechanics. And I also did, you know, ask her to take some vitamins so that her bone was stronger. So these patients, they can't be active. They can't participate in gym. They're obese because they're not moving. They're depressed. 
They're tight. Everything's tight. I mean, when you're tight, you feel miserable anyway. Tight Achilles, IT band, gluteus. These just make the situation terrible. With deformity correction, the pain disappears. The joint stabilizes. The patient can be active and lose weight. So, you know, it's looking at the whole patient, looking at their alignment. So now let's talk about patient number nine. This is an 11-year-old girl who complains of bilateral knee pain for two years. She points at her knee. She's got tight hamstrings, Achilles, IT bands. She's got genovalgum with 18 centimeters between her ankles that nobody noticed before. Again, you know, it's pretty significant. Her pain gets better with rest. She doesn't want to participate in sports because she's in pain. So she's 11. You would think she'd be a great candidate for guided growth until you look at her x-ray and see that she has no growth plates left. So this is a situation where she hit maturity very early. 11 years old, she's done, she's cooked. So it's a missed opportunity. She can't have guided growth. So the treatment for her is going to be to optimize her with therapy, make her as strong as we can, make her as stretched out as we can. She's never probably gonna be a real athlete, probably shouldn't take up running, um, but if she you know, if this fails and she really wants to have a big operation, we could fix it. But she'd have to agree to a big operation. So she may very well just go with activity modification. And so these pictures are just showing the, the um, space between her ankles. This is the same picture, but showing that the tops of the knees are marked. And what happens when she externally rotates her legs, she can get her, her legs together. So they can hide these. All right, let's go to patient 10. This is a 12-year-old boy with severe bowed legs. He has bilateral knee pain for two years, and he has achondroplasia. So he's an achondroplastic dwarf. He points at both of his knees for pain. The pain gets better with rest. He can't participate in sports because he's in too much pain, and he has trouble with activities of daily living because he's got short stature. So... When you look at the x-ray, you can see that his pain is the inside compartment because that's where all the pressure of the leg is going. And when his ankles are together, look at the big space between his knees. So in order to correct this deformity, he had an osteotomy of his tibia with placement in this external fixator. It's a ring fixator. It goes around the leg. And when he came in, I asked him if he wanted me just to straighten him out or to also give him some length because he had trouble getting on the toilet seat by himself, trouble getting on a chair, and his eyes almost popped out of his head when I said that I could lengthen him. So I put this growing nail into his femur and corrected the deformity in the tibia and basically got him 11 centimeters of length which was a lot for him. It may not sound like a lot, but you know, this, these procedures are somewhat painful. He's not running back to have, it in, have any more done because he feels like he is so much better now. He's now able to accomplish his activities of daily living he could not do before. Here's a nice picture that shows one lip fully um, aligned, lengthened, beautiful 11 centimeters before I started the other one. And here he is after they're both done. And I've been begging him to let me lengthen his humerus, but he's not in a rush to do that. He, um, he knows it's going to be, well, he thinks it's going to be painful. It probably won't be very painful. But that's something that would, again, be very useful to him. So now let's change gears a little bit and talk about limb length discrepancy. So I get patients sent to me for one leg being longer than the other. You need to look at the patient and consider what will be present at maturity. If the patient is skeletally mature, well, then we're done. We know what the deal is. And it can be due to congenital issues, fractures, trauma, tumor. Um, we see a lot of these minor discrepancies where the patient has, you know, a half-inch difference between their legs, 
when they're young, you sort of can look at them and say, well, if you have one centimeter now, and we know this discrepancy will stay proportionate to the way it's been growing, well, you're never going to hit two centimeters unless you're going to double in size. So when I present it like that to people, they kind of calm down and they say, okay, I guess we don't have a problem. But there are people that do have problems. And when there is a big discrepancy between the lens, then you may toe walk on the short leg, you may vault over the long leg, there's no good documentation of long-term effects, but you may develop hip arthritis on the long side because when your pelvis is tilted like this, your hip is a little bit uncovered. So maybe, you know, maybe you may experience increased knee pain on one side. You may have spine, you know, low back pain, but this is not clearly established. Limb, limb length discrepancy does not cause scoliosis, but asymmetry from the limb length discrepancy may appear clinically like scoliosis. So you're not going to get scoliosis, but maybe it'll make you look like you have it. The options for treatment are going to include non-surgical, where you put a shoe lift in, you can slow down the growth on the longer leg or do an epiphysiodesis to the distal femur or the proximal tibia. You can do a leg lengthening procedure on the shorter leg or you can take a, a, a piece of the longer leg out to surgically shorten it. Um, one way to empirically calculate limb length discrepancy, and this was set up by a Dr. Menelaus many years ago, is to just use the rule that girls stop growing by 14, boys by 16. You grow at the distal femur 10 millimeters per year, proximal tibia 6 millimeters per year, at the hip 2 millimeters, and at the ankle 4 millimeters per year. So an example of how to use these calculations is by saying that if we have an 11-year-old girl with a predicted limb length discrepancy of 3 centimeters at maturity, we know she's going to grow for three years, so one way to address this is to close her distal femur um, growth plate since that grows one, one centimeter per year, and she should come pretty close, or she should that should do that, do it for her. So um, that's one way we would use this calculation. We have other ways of calculating what will happen at maturity. There are some nice apps that are out that you put the numbers into and it gives you an idea of which growth plate and at what age would it be appropriate to close it for that particular child. So the summary for choice of treatment based on limb length discrepancy is that when you have zero to two centimeters, you don't have to do anything, okay? No treatment's needed, there's no clinical consequence, from two to six centimeters, you put a shoe lift in. You can do a, an epiphysiodesis on the long side. You can shorten the, um, the long side. From six to 20 centimeters, you can do a lengthening on the short side, plus you can also do something to the long side, so you don't have to do as much lengthening. Remember, depending on how you're doing it, it may be quite painful. And then when you have more than 20 centimeters um, difference between the legs, you can do a lot of lengthening. Or you can do prosthetic fitting. You have to remember that if you want to lengthen 20 centimeters, that's going to be a lot of time spent in the operating room. It's painful. Whereas prosthetics for lower extremity these days are absolutely beautiful and very, very functional. So you have to make an appropriate decision for that patient, maybe even with the fam, you know, have the family really think about it, and they may start doing some lengthening and at some point decide that they've had enough. So, you know, it just depends on the situation, and it depends on how many bones are missing, since this is typically found in a congenital um, abnormality from birth. So now let's move on to football season, our favorite Jets, except 
he's a little bit young for them, but we're going to talk about a 13-year-old obese boy. He has no complaints. He's perfectly happy sitting there. Mom complains he has a right-sided limp. He reports he had a knee injury three months ago and refers to it as, as his bad knee from an old football injury, which I just found so funny. Like, how does three months ago make it an old football injury? And since when does a 13-year-old have a bad knee? So I think he's watching too much TV. Anyway, he had full range of motion when he came in. He had some anterior thigh pain, which he identifies as knee pain. His leg externally rotates with um, hip flexion. So you see he's kind of an obligate external rotator. He has pain on internal rotation of the hip and loss of hip abduction. So that's our patient who he personally doesn't think he has any problem. Then we've got the 13-year-old boy who complains of a limp after playing football. He complains of a right groin pain. He has a groin pull for one week. So he's in the office to get that checked out. He's got a right-sided Trendelenburg limp. Like, he admits he has a limp. And so basically, a Trendelenburg limp is when if you stand on your normal leg, your gluteus muscle will tighten up and hold you so that your pelvis is um, aligned with the ground. If your, for some reason, your gluteus cannot contract and hold you properly, then your pelvis is going to fall on the opposite side. So every time you take a step, and you, in this case, if you stand on your right leg, you're going to keep um, swaying to your left. So I'm swaying to my left. Every time I take a step, my head and my body sort of goes over to the left. That's called a Trendelenburg gait. He's got full range of motion at the knee. He's got the anterior thigh pain, right groin pain with range of motion. His leg externally rotates just like the last child with hip flexion. He's got pain on attempted internal rotation, and he has loss of hip abduction. So what do these patients have? Well, they don't have a knee problem. I mean, some patients, lots of patients come to me with a knee problem, and I don't x-ray their hips. But in this case, especially the one who was insistent it was his knee, he's got a normal knee x-ray. However, they both have a slip capital femoral epiphysis. Now, I want to just mention that whenever you get x-rays of a hip, do, don't ever x-ray one hip because you may miss something on the other side. You always do an AP and frog pelvis so you can see both hips. That's just protocol. Do not get one hip. Um, and don't get tunnel vision with the knee. Like I said, check the hip and check the labs. Now we know that we've got a slip. You can see that the ice cream cone is falling off the, you know, the, the, the cone part. And the opposite side looks pretty good, actually. Um, <clears throat> but this can be exacerbated by having a very low vitamin D level. So you've got to check that. And if the vitamin D level is very low, well, there's more chance that you're going to slip the other hip. In the literature, there's up to a 60% bilateral slip, you know, slip found. I personally don't find 60%, but I do have bilaterals um, now and then. The other thing that you need to look for is hypothyroidism or some other endocrinopathy. Um, I once had a child that was so hypothyroid that I was not allowed to put the child to sleep because they were afraid of arrhythmias when the child uh, was going to be uh, awoken. So things to look for, you know, endocrinopathies, definitely uh, vitamin D deficiency and hypothyroidism. Now, the new classification that I guess isn't that new, but it is somewhat new for slips is where you describe them as stable or unstable. So even without measuring angles on the x-ray, if the patient can walk, that's a stable slip. That needs to be fixed, so maybe the next day, maybe two days later, you want to put the, the, the child on bed rest so they don't fall and knock it off the rest of the, day, the way, 
but it's stable and should not go on to avascular necrosis. You should be fine. An unstable slip is when the patient cannot ambulate, and those are the ones that go on to AVN, and those are emergent. So you need to get to those right away. So pearls for this talk are that you want to differentiate growing pains with modifiable musculoskeletal issues versus pain simply due to growth by considering limb alignment. You know, see if they're tight. Do they have tight hamstrings, glutes, IT bands, Achilles? Unilateral pain, asymmetric pain, bad, very bad. Send them off right away. Look out for progressive bowing, especially by 18 months. So ask the mom, is this better, same, or worse? Worse, definitely send them around. You, we're not really going to get x-rays before the age of 18 months. At least we're not supposed to, and I don't. Um, and I don't x-ray too many of these children. I need a good reason. All grades of symmetric knockney are accepted in the young except if they're asymmetric or progressive, I need to see them. Adolescent bowing, more than 15 centimeters, ortho consult. If you have a growing kid and you see their bow legged, send them around. Um, adolescent knock knee, more than 11 centimeters, we, you know, even if they're not complaining, we should talk about guided growth because that's something they can keep for the rest of their lives and it is life changing because that way they won't get early arthritis and need their knee replaced too young. Surgical options, hemiepiphyseodesis or guided growth. You need the growth plates open. Don't wait too long to send them. Osteotomy, we can do them. I've done them. It's a huge procedure. I don't rush to do that unless the patient absolutely has so much pain they're willing to have, have that done. Don't ignore chronic leg pain, growing pains, especially in adolescent children. Get the ortho consult because we can help them. And it's better to send them to therapy when they're tight before they get any more injuries. Up to one inch of limb length discrepancy is acceptable. In a teenager presenting with knee pain or limp, always think of the hip. And bone health is a consideration in all ages and all issues. Thank you. Uh, we're open for questions if anybody has any. If anybody thinks of anything and they want to email me, um, barbara.minkowitz at atlantichealth.org. You can always, or you can call my office. I'm happy to discuss anything. I don't see any questions. I guess we can call it now. I'm glad that you enjoyed it, that it was comprehensive. I enjoyed doing it. Um, if there's any topics that you would like to discuss, maybe we can set that up for another webinar at some other point. Anyway, thank you, everybody. Have a good night. On behalf of Morristown Medical Center Orthopedic Surgery, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. A post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. Please take a moment to complete this brief CME evaluation summary form to receive credit for attending the webinar. This concludes today's program. Thank you, and have a great day.